um, so we're going to be going through uh, the book of Romans today. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5, starting in verses 1. So if you guys want to go ahead and turn over there, Romans 5, verse 1. But before we dig into our text today, I want to give an introduction and a brief overview of the previous chapters of the book of Romans. So Romans is a letter written to the Christians in Rome by the Apostle Paul. According to Romans 15, Paul wrote the letter shortly before his visit to Jerusalem, where he was bringing aid to the poor among the saints there. Scholars date this book somewhere between the late, uh, late 54 AD or early 57 AD. So in Romans 1, Paul starts off with a gospel message that he has been called to proclaim. And he states that it is this gospel message that is the power of God for salvation to all those who believe for both Jew and Gentile. He also states that in the gospel message, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith and for faith. So Paul goes on to explain in chapter 1 that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. But God has revealed himself to all men by his creation, so that man is without excuse. Then in chapter 3, Paul says that both Jew and Gentile are under sin, that there is no one who is righteous, there is no one who does good, they have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that there is no fear of God before their eyes. Then starting in verse 20 of chapter 3, and continuing all the way through chapter 4, Paul talks about a key doctrine that we will be looking into today. This doctrine is, is justification by faith in Christ. Justification by faith is one of the most important doctrines of the Christian faith. Today we're going to look at this doctrine and what this means for our relationship with God. So now for our scripture reading today, we're going to read Romans 5, verses 1 through 11. Although we won't get through all 11 verses of Romans 5, I just want to read all 11 verses so that way we can see the context of what Paul's talking about. So Romans 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we, we praise your name, Lord. We thank you for letting us gather here together, Lord, to, to worship you, to learn more about you, to study your word. Lord, we pray most of all, Lord, that you'll be glorified today through the preaching of your word and, and through the worship, through music, Lord. I just pray that uh, you will open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, to the teaching you'll have for us today. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> all right, so Paul starts off chapter 5 with the word, therefore. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. So what should we all do when we see the word, therefore? That's right. What is, what is the therefore, therefore? So in order to, uh, to know what the therefore is there for, it's pointing back to Romans chapter 3, starting in, in about verse 20. This is where Paul introduce, introduces the doctrine of justification by faith. So if y'all want to flip back over to Romans chapter 3, and in verse 20 is where I'll start here. <clears throat> for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 
and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to, re- to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So here through in verses 20 through 26, Paul establishes the following truths about justification by faith. Number one, no one is justified by works of the law. Number two, this righteousness is by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification is for all who believe, for both Jew and Gentile. We are justified by grace as a gift through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is done by Jesus Christ. He is our propitiation. So propitiation means Jesus appeased or satisfied the wrath of God that was due to us because of our sin. Then lastly, in verse 26 here in chapter 3, it says it was to show the, his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So that last verse speaks of God's holiness and his righteousness. Someone asked me the other day, why can't God just forgive every one of their sins? God cannot just forgive every one of their sins because he is holy. So Proverbs 17:15 says, he who justifies the wicked... And he who condemns the righteous are both like an abomination to the Lord. So God cannot just overlook sin, and he does not just forgive sin without a proper payment for that sin. The wages of sin is death. A holy and righteous God must punish sin. In the atonement of Christ, our sin was placed on Christ, and God was satisfied with the atonement. His wrath was appeased because it was poured out on Christ as a just penalty So God would be unjust to pronounce a wicked man as justified if there was not a penalty for that sin. A judge cannot let an evil person off the hook. He would be an evil judge. Christ died on behalf of his people to appease the wrath of God, but not only did he appease the wrath of God, he credited our account with Jesus' righteousness. God now looks upon his people as if they had never sinned. This is glorious news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here in Romans 3, we see Paul speak of the righteousness of God that comes to us by faith in in Jesus. So what is meant by this righteousness that Paul speaks of here? Well, Martin Luther referred to this righteousness as an alien righteousness, or meaning a righteousness that is foreign to us. It does not depend on us. It is not our own righteousness. As the prophet Isaiah says, our righteous deeds are filthy rags. So we are unclean and unrighteous. This alien righteousness that Luther and Paul speak of comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ always did the things that pleased the Father. He withstood the temptation in the wilderness from Satan. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. He lived his entire life without sin. We also see another thing that Christ did. He went willingly to the cross and received the just punishment that we sinners deserve for our sin. So he bore the wrath of God on behalf of his people. Therefore, he has fulfilled all righteousness. So how is is it that we can receive this righteousness of Christ? This is a crucial component to the doctrine of the justification by faith. This righteousness comes to us by imputation. So the doctrine of imputation is twofold. Well, actually, it's threefold. First, at birth, Adam's sin is imputed to us because we are born under the curse of Adam. So therefore, so this is Romans 5:12 it says therefore just as sin came into the world through one man that's Adam and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So not only are we born in sin, we also are responsible of our sin because we we are sinners. So then we see the last two part last two parts of this threefold doctrine of imputation and what is known as the great exchange. So when Jesus went to the cross All of the sins of his people that have ever been committed were imputed to Jesus. And in exchange, Jesus, his righteousness is imputed to his people. So Romans 5.19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, that would be Adam again, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Then in 2 Corinthians 5.21 he says, 
For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So think about this for a second. All of the sins ever committed by God's people, all of past, present, and future, of, of all of God's people, past, present, and future, were placed on Christ on the cross. So at that very moment, God saw Jesus as the most wretched sinner ever. So that is why Christ cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the cup of God's wrath was poured out full strength on the Son of God. Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, drank that cup of God's wrath down to the dregs on our behalf. So therefore, bringing peace to his people by the blood of his cross. When we trust in Christ and in his righteousness, it is credited to our account. So Isaiah 53, 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Further on in Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, Yes, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and, and makes intercession for the transgressors. So what a glorious doctrine this is. We all deserve God's wrath because we are all wicked. But Jesus Christ took the wrath that we deserve, and we have received his righteousness. It has been credited to our account. Now God sees us as if we have never sinned. He sees us as holy. All right, so Paul continues on in chapter 4 of Romans, and we see a little bit more detail about what justification is. So in 4, Abraham was, we see that Abraham was justified by faith. So Romans 4, 3 says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Then further on down in, in chapter 4, verse 23, we, we see that this same justification can come to all those who believe in Christ. So, but the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Note also that, that in that in verse 25 there, that not only is the death of Christ important for this doctrine of justification, but also his resurrection. In verse 25 it says he was raised for our justification. Okay, so let's summarize this doctrine real fast. So here's the definition. Justification is a legal act of God in which God declares a guilty sinner not only as innocent, but as righteous. God sees this sinner not only as a, is pardoned of his sin, but as if he has never sinned. This righteousness is based on Jesus Christ and on his righteousness imputed to the sinner by the shedding of his blood. So, and this was accomplished by our Lord Jesus Christ's work on the cross, by his perfect obedience under the law of God, and by his victory over sin and death at his resurrection. And then, so justification is a once and for all act of God. It is by faith and not by works. Justification is by grace and not by law. Justification is by the power and will of God, not by man's will or his volition. So now that we have established what justification by faith is, let's go back to Romans 5, since we, we now see what the word therefore is therefore. So therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So this word, therefore, is really important. Paul is saying, pay attention to this, this doctrine of justification. It, it is, this is why it's important, because now that we have been justified, we have peace with God. So what is peace with God? I think this is the most comforting part of all of Scripture. This peace gives us assurance of salvation. What does Paul mean by peace with God? So when you hear the world speak about peace, you think of a, a peaceful feeling or a, a feeling of comfort or tranquility. 
This worldly peace is, is subjective. We're not talking about a subjective peace here. Paul is speaking about an objective peace. This peace that Paul is speaking about is a standing or a relationship. So when we are at peace with God, we are in right standing or in a right relationship with him. It's easier to explain peace when you understand what the opposite of peace is. What is the opposite of peace? That's right, war. The opposite of peace is war. Sinners are at war with God. All of mankind who is not in Christ is at enmity with God. We are under God's wrath. They are spiritually dead, haters of God, hostile towards God, children of wrath, and children of the devil. But here's the thing. Not only are sinners at war with God, but more importantly or more frightening, frighteningly is that God is at war with sinners. Listen to what the scripture says about God towards sinners. Exodus 15.3 says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Nahum 1.2, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Romans 2.5, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Psalm 5.5, 5, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. Evil you destroy those who speak lies. The Lord ab abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Psalm 2.12, Kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. John 3.36, Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Revelation 19.15, From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Revelation 14.10, he will drink the wine of God's wrath, pulled, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. And two more, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Psalm 711 says, God is a righteous judge, a God who is angry with the wicked every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. So this is what it means to be at war with God. This is why Hebrews 10 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now that we have established that the unregenerate man is at war with God, or rather God is at war with the unregenerate man, what does peace with God mean? It means the war is over. We are no longer under his wrath. Our sins have been forgiven. We are clothed in the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. His righteousness has been credited to our account. We are no longer at enmity with God. We are now his friend, his adopted child, his heir, united to Christ, and we are his beloved bride. When Jesus died on the cross, he bore our sins in his body, and God was satisfied. The penalty of sin was paid in full, and there was nothing left to be paid. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. So the war that God declared with man and his sin in the garden is over between God and those who have trusted in him and have been reconciled. We now have eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is peace. It is a relationship. We are now at peace with God. Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were sinners we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we shall live by his life. So Jesus has made peace by the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 20 through 22 says, Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So now that we have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ and he has made peace by the blood of his cross, we are at peace with God. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. This is once and for all. There's nothing that can snatch us out of his hands or out of the Father's hands. We are secure, united to Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. This salvation is eternal. Christ has come and has reconciled us to God by his blood and has given us eternal life in his name. This is one of the most glorious passages in all of Scripture. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. 
All right, back to Romans 5.1. So, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, through our Lord Jesus Christ, many times we read over this passage and pay little attention to it. Through our Lord Jesus Christ is a glorious phrase. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, we have nothing and we are nothing. Everything we have discussed, justification, peace with God, grace, all of it, it was accomplished by Christ. He has paid it all. We owe him everything. He is our all in all. Romans 11.36 says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory alone. Amen. So through our Lord Jesus Christ and through him only, our salvation is accomplished. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. We have access to God. And, I'm sorry, I messed up there. <laughs> Got a little too far there. So, he, may we never forget that our Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done for us. All right, now moving on to verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith in this grace in which we stand. So now that we have been justified by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ, we have access to God and to his grace. In the garden, in the garden Adam and Eve had direct access to God, but when they sinned, they lost that access. Under the Old Covenant, access to God was limited. When God appeared to Moses on Mount Horeb, Moses had to hide his face because he was afraid to look at God. And then in Exodus 19, we see that Moses and Aaron were allowed, the only ones allowed to go up to the top of Mount Sinai. The rest of the nation of Israel, including the priests, weren't even allowed to touch the mountain or they would die. See, the Holy of Holies was a place that only the high priest could enter into, and he could only do this once a year on the Day of Atonement. And this was after much cleansing and washing. He would go in behind the curtain, holding a censer of burning incense to shield him from the holiness of God. But now, under the New Covenant, we have direct access to God. How do we have this access? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. He came down to earth and went to the cross, what happened, when Jesus, what happened when Jesus went to the cross as he uttered the words to tell us I heard it is finished? God ripped the curtain of the temple in two from top to bottom. Matthew 27, 51 says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Then in Hebrews 10, 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So in the new covenant, we have direct access to God through our mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see this in Hebrews. So now that we have this direct access, in Hebrews 4, 16, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this is summed up in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 14. Ephesians 2, 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments, expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So back to verse 2. Um, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So not only do we have access to God, but we have access to his grace. So what is Grace. So A.W. Pink defines grace in his book, The Attributes of God, as this. 
Grace is the lone source from which flows the goodwill, love, and salvation of God unto his chosen people. He goes on to say, Divine grace is a sovereign and saving favor of God, exercised in bestowing blessings upon those who have no merit in them and for which no compensation is demanded. And Paul says in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. So we can summarize grace as this. Grace is unmerited favor of God given to his people, not based on anything that they have done, but based solely on God's loving, sovereign choice as the gift. This grace only comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to stand in grace? Well, first of all, when we as Christians, we sin, we remember that where sin abounds, grace abounds more. And as Romans 6.14 says, sin will have no dominion over us since we are no longer under law but under grace. So since we have been justified by grace, do we maintain this salvation by works of the law? By no means. We have been saved by, great, by the grace of God, and God will maintain our standing before him by his grace. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So not only are we justified by grace, but we are sanctified by grace. Galatians 3.3 3 says, Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? So Paul is saying here, we are not perfected by our flesh to the law of God. We are sanctified by God's grace. So now that we have access to God and to his grace, we stand in this. This is our confidence. We are at peace with God, having been justified through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can be sure that our salvation is secure. Paul in 2 Corinthians tells, us, tells the church there to stand firm in the faith. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5.12, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So through him, we have access by faith and to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So this peace with God and this access to God and to his grace, it leads us to rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is not only looking forward to our final glorification with confidence, knowing that Christ will give us eternal life, but it's also now that we can rejoice in this while we are still here. Okay, so how can we apply this to our lives? First of all, I want to talk to the unregenerate person. My friends, if there's anyone here who is not in Christ, who is not at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, God's wrath abides on you. You are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when he will pour out his wrath full strength. If you are not in Christ, there will be a day coming when you will be cast into the lake of eternal fire. Listen to what the scripture says. You will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and you will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of your torment goes up forever and ever, and you will have no rest day or night, you worshiper of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark in its name. I do not want this for you. Listen to what Christ did for sinners. Jesus, who is God, the second person of the Trinity, he took on human flesh. He was born of a woman, born under the law. He lived the perfect righteous life that none of us could ever live, and he fulfilled the law. He died on the cross and was buried, and three days later he rose from the grave, defeating sin and death. When he was on the cross, he bore the wrath of God on behalf of sinners like you and like me, and he gives his righteousness to those who will put their trust in him. He commands everyone to repent and to trust in him. My friend, turn to Christ, repent of your sin, and trust in him. Psalm 7, 12 through 13 says, If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Turn to Christ and live. He will give you everlasting life. Okay, now I want to talk to the Christians. As Christians, how then shall we live, knowing that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ? So as Christians, we rejoice in knowing that Christ has come and he has made peace between us and God. We know that our salvation is secure, and when we receive attacks from the accuser, we can stand firm in the grace of God and know that the Lord Jesus Christ 
is at the right hand of the Father, always interceding for us. When we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In him, we are adopted sons of God. In Christ, we are united to Christ. In Christ, we are at peace with God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, he is the Prince of Peace. He is the Mediator. He is the King of Kings. We stand in grace, and to this we rejoice in God's glory. So that's, that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to rejoice in this. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we praise your name, Lord. We thank you for, for your Son who has brought peace between us and, and you, Lord. Uh, just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to remember that, Lord. When we, when we do sin, Lord, I praise you that we have an advocate with you, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is our mediator, Lord. I pray, I pray for those here who do not know you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will open their eyes and their hearts, Lord, and that they will, they will trust in you for salvation. Lord, I pray all these things in Christ's name.